I uh, have been tasked this afternoon with addressing the subject of the role of evaluation in assessing the development contribution of private sector operations. In doing so, I would like to cover three topics. Number one, the nature and role of private sector operations in development and the work of MDBs in encouraging it. Number two, the implications of this work for us as evaluators when assessing the contribution of private sector operations. And number three, some knowledge gained from evaluation evidence on the experience of promoting private sector for development. Let me tackle the first uh, is issue first, the nature and role of private sector operations in development and the work of NDBs in encouraging it. How and why NDBs promote private sector development. The private sector is an unmatched force in the development process. It is a prime mover, stakeholder, and partners, partner in this dynamic uh, process. As such, the private sector is a critical ingredient of our efforts to address the global development challenges that are confronting us. As a group of eminent economists and policymakers responsible for the 2008 Commission on Growth and Development report, which must be familiar to several of you, noted, there's no known effective substitute for relying on markets to allocate resources efficiently, led by the private sector. The private sector generates 90% of jobs in developing countries, and jobs are the best avenue for the poor to escape poverty. The private sector drives economic growth and thus it facilitates the improvement of people's lives by providing goods and services to meet their needs, by promoting innovation and efficiency, and by mobilizing financial resources for progress. And when it is inclusive, the growth propelled by the private sector allows the poor women and vulnerable groups to participate in the mainstream economy. Likewise, the private sector provides a much needed tax revenues to support government operations and the delivery of essential public goods. This natural synergy between the private sector and various other stakeholders is at the heart of development and progress. It is precisely this powerful role of the private sector in development that motivates multilateral development banks like the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank Group to support private sector initiatives for development around the world. Furthermore, the Sustainable Development Goals, the framework offered by the Sustainable Development Goals, recognizes that to accomplish the 17 goals, Strengthening part partnership with the private sector would be one of its cornerstones of success, as many of us know. Parallel to this, the global consensus on SDGs, uh, well, parallel to that, this global consensus on SDGs, the ADB Strategy 2030 has now put the private sector operations at the center of development results in Asia and the Pacific. ADB is ambitiously targeting private sector operations to reach one-third of its total number of operations by 2024. And many other donors are doing the same thing, recognizing the importance of the private sector for development. Over the years, while promoting private sector operations, MDBs in particular have largely been guided by four principles. They all designed to ensure that private sector initiatives enhance development and mitigate external ex negative externalities. The first principle is emphasizing the commercial sustainability and profitabi profitability of operation. The second is focusing on addressing market failures originated by asymmetric information, incomplete markets, barriers to entry. Third is the principle of promoting high standards of conduct related to environmental, social, corporate governance, transparency, integrity. Fourth and last is ensuring additionality, central to the operations of NDBs operating in this space, which means that NDBs contribution should go beyond 
what the markets are able to provide, avoiding crowding out the private sector, while simultaneously catalyzing market, uh, market development. Fine, we understand what the private sector is and the power and potential of uh, the private sector. What are the implications of promoting the private sector for our work as evaluators? How is evaluation of private sector operation done in MDBs? From what I have explained, I trust that it is now evident that the institutions intervening in the private sector development space do so with a triple bottom line, financial, economic, and social and environmental. If one would be interested in the financial bottom line only, the market would suffice. You wouldn't need evaluators as us. However, in order to understand the combined effect of the three bottom lines, evaluation is, is indispensable because the market will never provide the appropriate indicators on economic, social, and environmental concerns. Some of you may be asking yourself, why am I providing you with so much detail about the nature of interventions to promote private sector development in a group of uh, evaluators? The reason is that an overarching tenet in evaluation, and majority of you, all of you, uh, must be aware of it, is that the assessment frameworks that we use must be consistent with the object of evaluation. Therefore, in order to evaluate private sector interventions, it is critical to understand the rationale and the overall theory of change behind these interventions. Precisely, to take care of these concerns, MDBs have developed a set of good practice standards anchored in the principles that I have just explained. The GPS, good practice standard, take into account the complex nature of private sector support while blending financial indicators with economic, social, and environmental assessments. The underlying evaluation framework on private sector evaluation is thus composed of four criteria, which are the ones that we use to assess private sector operations. First is business success, which is logical now, I, uh, I hope, from what I said before. In response to market features that I already explained, the framework recognizes the preponderance of our internal rate of returns. In other words, companies and projects that are supported by institutions like ADB using public money to support private sector must be profitable. Second, the second criteria is economic sustainability, considering the public nature of NDB's investment, the framework incorporates the economic rate of return, broader impacts of the investment, or a proxy of it. The third criteria is environmental and social effects. Mindful of the potential positive or negative externalities, the framework gives priority to environmental and social effects of investment. And the fourth criteria is the overall impact on private sector development and broader development influence of the interventions. So conscious of NDB's specific mission, the framework then includes transitional uh, the impacts like in uh, IBR, EBRD, developmental or structural change, uh, like here in, uh, in ADB or in IFC. Uh, or in AIDB. And complementing the above, these four criteria that I just explained, the evaluation framework assesses the institutional financial performance and what I just said a moment ago, the additionality to ensure that market rules prevail and that the institutions like ours do not crowd out private sector operators. Taking all together this evaluating principle, uh, of uh, private sector projects are the core criteria uh, to assessing the performance of the institution and the intervention that have been financed by us. Now we understand the nature of private sector operations. We have covered the 
implications for us as evaluators and how we interpret this nature of this type of intervention, that object of evaluation. So what have we learned? What do we know from years of uh, being evaluated private sector intervention? Of course, I'll just try to give you a glance of uh, what we know. Uh, what we know in terms of evidence on macro, micro interventions, and what we call inclusion targeted or inclusion non-targeted type of operations of uh, intervention of NDB, MDBs. Or macro interventions, the broader type of interventions that this institution do to improve the overall context of operations of private sector, opera uh, private sector operations. We have learned that contrary to popular belief, profitability and development impact can go hand in hand. Evidence consistently show that commercial success is closely linked to high development outcomes. We have learned also that promoting the building blocks of business climate reforms, laws, regulation, uh, studies, etc., is insufficient to stimulate the development of private sector. Good implementation coupled with strong long-term strategic guidance and continuity are necessary. We too have learned that additionality has strong connection with development impact. Robust outcomes are apparent when strong financial and non-financial additionality are present in the operations. When we go to micro initiatives more directed to specific operations, we clearly understand that strengthening the environment surround, surrounding firms is critical and that stimulating innovation and entrepreneurship are important for firm, firm and sector competitiveness. But innovative projects tend to have lower rates of success. We have also learned and have evidence of and common sense would also indicate, which also indicate a need for an increased appetite for failure during experiments before approaches are scaled up. Development efforts supporting SMEs have also shown the need to ground support to SMEs on clear understanding of the market failures confronting SMEs and that providing them with financial support alone is not sufficient. For they also require capacity building to improve efficiency and standards. On the use of uh, inclusion targeted, uh, non-targeted intervention, non-targeted like building roads or building, building ports, which have an inclusion component, but they are not ta specifically targeted. We have evidence showing that focusing on economic growth alone cannot adequately promote social inclusion. It does not come auto automatically. In a related matter, efficient investments that are supported by institutions do not guarantee on their own broader welfare gains. And I had a number of examples of this type of uh, uh, operations that confirm what I just said. Critical ingredients for this to happen broader welfare gains, include effective job creation, access to essential services, and good distribution of the bene benefits of growth. So now let me bring this talk to, conclusion, to a conclusion in the hope that the potential, rational, and challenges in promoting private sector development and the complexities to evaluate the associated interventions are now at least a bit clearer in our minds. On the potential and rationale specifically, China clearly stands out in using the private sector for achieving greater development impact. We have all witnessed what has happened in China over uh, the last 40 years. The key lies in making sure that the right public policies for harnessing the potent force of the private sector for development are in place. This framework is well expressed by the late late reformist leader Deng Xiaoping. When he was asked if China was embracing capitalism, he said, and I quote, there are no fundamental contradictions between a socialist system and a market economy. If we combine a planned economy with a market economy, we shall be in a better position to liberate the productive forces and speed up economic growth, close quote. While this approach has worked specifically for China, the general point is that vision, 
As it was indicated today, in the morning, vision, discipline, and perseverance in designing and implementing policies conducive to unleash the private sector dynamism is of the essence. Indeed, China's patient wisdom to select the critical area for reform and pragmatism in the pursuit of uh, its market and private sector growth have led to the most remarkable development performance in history, in the history of humanity, in just four decades. And so as other countries of Asia and the Pacific embark in similar efforts, and organizations like ADB deepen their support to promote the private sector in our region, while at the same time increase our chances as uh, countries, nations of achieving the SDGs, we evaluators must also sharpen our knowledge, our experience and our practice to accompany these efforts. I therefore trust that this presentation has steered somehow your interest to explore more on the challenges and opportunities that this trend offers to our countries, to our discipline, and to all of us. And I invite you to follow up uh, closely the work of ADB in this field and the evaluations of the Independent Evaluation Department in the area of promoting private sector development in Asia and the Pacific. Maramin Salamat, thank you so very much. Thank you very much. The topic for today's uh, panel discussion is going to be the same as the, as the topic that Marvin just uh, presented on, which is the role of evaluation in emerging markets with a specific focus on private sector operations and ADB perspective. Now, we have an esteemed group of panelists here joining us to discuss this topic. And let me introduce the panelists to you, starting with Shanbin Yao. He works as a special senior advisor to the president of ADB. He coordinates all of ADB's development effectiveness work and engages with the ADB's board committee on development effectiveness. And he's our counterpart in the senior management in terms of independent evaluations. Shan Bin will provide the senior management perspective in the panel. Thank you, Shan Bin. So the next panelist is Mark Kunzer. He joins us from Private Sector Operations Department. So he'll be providing the private sector operations perspective on, on the panel. Mark um, has um, several years of experience in ADB, and he works specifically in private sector transaction support division. And in that, he provides support to the origination and implementation teams uh, with regards to safeguards, development effectiveness, integrity, and technical assistance. And prior to his current role, he was a principal environment specialist, both here at ADB and in the private sector. Thank you, Mark, for uh, joining the panel. Now, next is uh, Aman, Aman Trana. She's director, public financial management division, procurement portfolio and financial management department. Aman brings more than 25 years of experience in financial management, financial reporting, auditing, and governance. And prior to ADB, Aman used to work at the IMF and in the World Bank. Thanks, Aman, for joining the panel. And finally, we have our own on the panel, uh, Alex Wellesteed. Um, he works in independent evaluations, and he covers private sector operations. In fact, uh, Alex is now currently working on an evaluation on PPPs for the bank. Alex uh, has been with us for the last seven months. And prior to joining ADB, he comes to us from IFC, um, and he was involved with equity and structure finance business. Thanks, Alex, for joining the panel. Now, before we get started on, on the panel discussion, I just want to set the stage. I think Marvin did a fantastic job in terms of laying out the key aspects of private sector and the evaluation of private sector. So let me just take the opportunity here to set the stage for what we're going to discuss here today as part of the panel. Private sector, it's been established now, is uh, much needed in order to enable and sustain growth in, in the region. The Asian experience has shown that 
growth and poverty reduction go hand in hand. And in fact, this has been well demonstrated in different countries uh, here in Asia, and specifically as has been highlighted by the keynote speaker was the case in China. Now, all the governments in the region and in fact globally are seeking alternative sources of capital to public sources of capital, right, to fill important gaps in infrastructure and to be able to fund lower income population through microfinance and, and SME finance. And private sector also provides an important ability to increase efficiency of uh, public sector uh, service delivery. Now, profit seeking and competition are, are primary in terms of private sector operations. But what does that lead to? It leads to innovation and economic development. And so private sector, through its natural role, brings about knowledge, and contributions in terms of how investments need to be managed. And this contributes to growth in the overall region. Now in this context, where does MDB come in? So private sector naturally doesn't go into the difficult parts of the market. We have a number of fragile and conflict affected regions, even here in Asia. And even among countries that are more developed like China, there are pockets in the market where, which are less developed. And so there is a need for MDBs like the Asian Development Bank to go on and address some of the difficult areas of in these various countries in terms of private sector and expand the private sector, expand the pie so that the other private sector can come in and make a bigger contribution. And thus I think this panel will try to address that and try to bring in some of the salient features in terms of how private sector can be more effective. Now, Shambin mentioned that ADB through its strategy 2030 is expanding private sector operations in the bank. So that's also an important context to have in this discussion. Now, so what does all this mean? That an expanding private sector, private sector being so important in the region, and it needs to be evaluated and it needs to have some accountability built in using public money for private purposes. And there also needs to be learning that comes out of this, right? That goes into the feedback loop to improve uh, operations. So that's what our independent evaluation department tries to do, is to contribute to accountability and, and learning. And so there are also other things that are unique about private sector. The, the, if you were to look at public and private sector, the private sector has a double bottom line. It needs to be profitable. It cannot displace. The money that the MDBs provide to the private sector cannot displace the market. It has to add to the market. And so value addition and additionality are, are key features of MDB's contribution to the private sector. So Shanbin, how is ADB positioned to address the growing needs of private sector in, in, in the region? Can you talk about the plans for private sector in, in the ADB corporate strategy and what the plans are over the next 10, 15 years. ADB, uh, the, the, the private sector, Asia, growth opportunities, sustainability, and uh, the role of the bank. We heard from Marvin, we heard from uh, Nathan. I like uh, 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 just add a few points to reinforce what, what's been said about uh, ADB's positioning and ADB's plans in this area at a broader level. And my colleagues, and uh, we have a private sector operation colleagues who deal with uh, much details, uh, the, uh, much uh, nuanced understanding. I'd like to take the, briefly the history of the bank and the Asia. As Marvin noted, the, the, this region's growth experience, development performance is really seen exemplified, characterized by the growth of the uh, market-driven uh, economy, entrepreneurship, and jobs creation, much of it supported by the private sector uh, work. And mind you also that, that uh, underpinned by strong enabling environment, policies, institutions, infrastructure, and, all the, and human capital, all these are calls for there. So we need to see in, in this broader context. And in that, 
historically, ADB has been and working in the private sector, strictly the private sector operations, about 40 years ago. Uh, early 80s, we have we set up uh, a, dip, a unit working on private sector operations, private sector operations alone. So, and going forward, this challenge and opportunities of jobs, incomes, and uh, of course sustainability uh, looms much larger. So, and that, that requires us to better positioned to uh, address these issues. Better positioned to address these issues, not just in mature economies, in emerging economies, but also in frontier economies, I was saying that uh, uh, Nathan um, alluded to. And what are the, some of the key and uh, areas of focus? Again, enabling, policy in enabling work. The work, our public sector operations work on technical assistance, on, on infrastructure, on human capital. Um, and all these are provides that uh, underpinnings for development and for entrepreneurship development, mind you, also. That's, that's very, very, very important risk-taking uh, effort. And second, is really looking into the, the, the tra from transactions point of view and uh, some of the important operations we are looking into. And uh, bring in the PPP dimension. So the public, the private, and the, pub and the public private. So in that continuum, that's what we are, are focusing on. And, and then the country space, regional space, that's also the areas. Now, we heard about the targets, but the three thirds, uh, oh, one third of ADB operations will be in private sector in terms of internal number. And there's another figure going forward. We're talking about uh, ADB will strive for further increase the uh, leveraging, the co-financing. ADB alone will not do as much. You know, but the financing needs is huge here for, for, for supporting private sector development. So leveraging that financing for, for, through our capital market work, through our, our an SME work, and uh, very importantly, through the work on addressing the uh, uh, SOEs, public enterprises. So, and, uh, so uh, I'll stop here. Maybe, and, uh, yeah, yeah th thank you. Thank you, Sean Ben. Now, let's hear it from Mark, um, from, from private sector operations, who are uh, tasked with implementing ADB's operations in, in the private sector area. So, Mark, how is PSOD going to address the growing demand of the region for, for, for private capital? Um, I think ADB's private sector department is already well positioned and currently plays a, a key role in, in mobilizing private sector resources for development. Um, and it's been very reassuring to hear all the, uh, the speakers before me um, agreeing that it's, it's widely accepted that the private sector is necessary for sustaining rapid growth and creating quality jobs, both of which are essential tools for uh, reducing poverty. Um, we already focus on ensuring that our projects create jobs, um, that we br help innovation and efficiency in the region, uh, and that we, we aim to bring the poor, uh, women and, and vulnerable groups into the economy. Um, PSOD um, already has a, a critical role in addressing the, the large gaps uh, in the markets that exist across Asia and the Pacific. Um, these gaps range from um, a lack of short-term finance for uh, trade, a gap which our trade finance program is very successfully filling at the moment, uh, a lack of medium-term finance for small to medium enterprises uh, across the region, uh, which we're tackling uh, by partnering with local banks and other financial intermediaries to provide loans to SMEs. Um, and finally, a lack of long-term finance for the funding of the huge infrastructure requirements the region faces. So, uh, Jan Bin's already mentioned that Strategy 2030 requires private sector operations to reach one-third of uh, ADB's total operations by 2024. Um, we've also um, been... Um, uh, delivered a new strategy last year, Strategy 2030, which contains a, a lot of um, key priority areas. And so going forward, uh, we are going to have to ensure that as we expand our operations, we are also closely aligned with the priority areas set out in the strategy. 
and will be driven by the, the key objective of pursuing development impact. But as already been mentioned, we, at the same time, we need to ensure that we maintain long-term profitability and, and commercial sustainability as an institution. So um, what are the key operational priorities for ADB's private sector operations? Uh, I'm going to focus on two this afternoon. Um, one of the key priorities, as has already been mentioned, is that we need to be catalyzing and mobilizing development of finance. And it's got to be recognized that ADB's resources are, are finite and limited. So we need to be um, in a position where we're not crowding out other commercial lenders, but instead we're mobilizing uh, additional commercial lending wherever possible. Um, again, the, the, the target in Strategy 2030 is very ambitious. Uh, for every dollar of ADB investment, we must bring in two and a half dollars of long-term co-financing from other investment partners by 2030. That is a, is, a, is a big target for us to meet. So to do that, we're going to need to expand our partnerships uh, with uh, other institutional investors, such as insurance companies and pension funds, both within and outside Asia. Um, and as an institution, we can begin to add value uh, by offering B loans, political risk guarantees, partial credit guarantees and risk transfers. And so help make uh, investments more attractive and hopefully that will lead to crowding in other investors. Um, a second priority for um, private sector is to expand the geographic reach of private sector operations and also to develop business in new sectors. Um, we're going to give a lot more attention to projects uh, in fragile and conflict-affected states. But um, sovereign operations will, will continue to lead the bank's work in these countries in providing support for security uh, and institutional strengthening, while the private sector focus uh, will have to be on investment facilitation uh, and the development of uh, essential infrastructure such as telecommunications, banking systems, and supporting the development in nascent sectors such as tourism and agriculture. I'm also going to add in a, a short um, section here on the small island developing states of the Pacific because they're also going to become a priority for PSOD. And we're going to need to provide a, a customized approach to development uh, uh, in these countries because they face unique challenges. Um, PSOD's traditional strengths uh, in infrastructure finance for uh, energy, water, transport um, are likely to be met by sovereign lending in the, in the foreseeable future. And so um, private sector operations are going to need to focus on other opportunities, um, maybe in sectors such as fisheries and tourism. And in order to uh, expand the geographic reach, uh, we need to move closer to our clients and partners. PSOD is still a very centralized department within ADB, and I think only 8% um, of our staff are in regional offices at the moment. Uh, and so there's a need to increase the presence of, of our staff in key locations in Asia and the Pacific. Um, and finally, just a very quick word on some of the priority sectors for PSOD going forward. Um, infrastructure um, has traditionally been uh, a significant proportion of the private sector portfolio, and this will continue. However, going forward, we're going to need to align our projects with the operational priorities of Strategy 2030 uh, and promoting quality infrastructure investments that are green, sustainable, resilient, and inclusive. Um, PSAD will not finance any new coal-fired generation, oral exploration, or coal mining. Um, the financial sector will be continue uh, to be another core priority for us um, and we'll continue to support its development in our DMCs. Uh, lack of access to finance, uh, information, uh, markets uh, and other economic uh, opportunities often inhibits those on the lowest incomes from participation in the economy. In 2018, PSOD provided uh, $900 million support uh, to the financial sector in our DMCs. And going forward, um, we're going to continue to focus on microfinance, SME banking, and providing small-scale producers and manufacturers with access to export platforms and other markets. Um, 
We'll also be uh, increasing focus in other sectors such as agriculture, health, education, uh, and we'll continue to look for opportunities to support the introduction of new innovative and disruptive technologies to our DMCs. So that's a, a very brief synopsis of the operational priorities of PSOD. I'll finish by noting that we are preparing a PSOD operational plan at the moment, uh, and this will be released later in the year, and that will obviously have a, a lot more detail than I've been able to present today. Thank you. Uh, that's that's an excellent overview, and I think, Mark, uh, it, it lays out how complicated uh, the private sector operations are. It goes all the way from short-term operations to, to longer-term infrastructure financing and, and so many different sectors and objectives in terms of co-financing, which is so important, I think, because we're still a drop in the bucket when compared to a number of the bigger countries here in the region. Now, with that said, I think that this, this, we need to understand the data on the system side of what, what does it mean in terms of private sector operations and how does that fit in here in the bank. Aman, um, you, you see the financial data management side of, of the bank. You see it on the public side of the bank. The bank is primarily, 90% uh, of the bank is on the public side, 10% of the bank is on the private side. But Aman has a good view of this from both sides. Broadly speaking, how is ADB positioned to, to collect, collate and report on data required for expansion of private sector operations? Um, like any other major organization, big organization, particularly in MDBs, we struggle with data. I think especially on the public sector, given, as Nathan said, it's 90%. So we struggle not just with the volume of data that we must deal with, but also to be analyze that data. Because going forward, data is democratized. On your phones right now, on your iPads, you could probably have as much access as we do. But the question is, what does one do with data? And I think that's what the ADB struggles with. And as private sector operations gears up, that's what it will also struggle with. So I think I can be forthright and say at the ADB it's a work in progress in terms of how we collect data because it's not just at the project base, it's not just by a deal, it's also by country, by sector, uh, by region. We need to know all that to be, have, to be able to make meaningful investment decisions, to be able to collate it based on those categories and to decide what's happening or where should we target our funds, whether it's public or private sector. And from that, if you look at, in terms of reporting, that's also somewhat lags behind. There's many data points that are available, particularly for private sector operations. There's data that they have to report to us, that there's data that's publicly available, and there's also data that they have but may not be publicly available due to confidentiality requirements, particularly if they're SOEs, et cetera. So data is really a struggle in terms of getting it, making sure it's accurate, and ensuring that what we do with it is meaningful for future investment decisions. Um, there's also increasingly in the ADB an emphasis on tacit knowledge, which at least in the public sector is very, very important because what is, it, what is tacit knowledge? It's things that we know but we perhaps don't share, that are not documented, that are not systemized. And I think for the private sector that's also important that to going forward that there are systems developed where that knowledge that we inherently have that we tacitly hold is shared so that investment decisions can be made uh, more, more critically. And again, if profitability was the only marker for investment, that's fine. We know how that, how that is measured. But we also need data on sustainability, on impact. And those can be, not necessarily can be subjective. Country to country, region to region, project to project, deal to deal. So in that regard, getting the quality of data is very important and having a measurement aspect of that is very important. So at the ADB, we're working very hard right now. There's a dig digital agenda 2030 that kind of uh, uh, is going to modernize our reporting, our data collection, our collation, and our analysis to come up with far more integrated systems. And our private sector operations are very much included in that to have more seamless deal origination, to have more seamless reporting so there's meaningful data there. Uh, so I think I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Aman. Now, finally, to close the loop here, right, uh, let's hear it. The, the evaluation perspective, the independent evaluation perspective. So Alex, uh, as an independent evaluator, what are the broad characteristics for evaluating private sector operations? Um, what do you think is the role of MDBs in, in, in the private sector and how do you, how do you uh, 
look through to see how the objectives of the MDBs are captured and can be reflected in evaluations. Uh, one of the critical things from an evaluator's perspective, the difference between private sector evaluation and public sector evaluation as it applies here at ADB is that we have a different evaluative framework. There is some overlap, you could say, with what we look at on, on the public sector side. But on the private sector side, we, we have specific areas around business success that we talk about around profitability, uh, economic sustainability, environmental and social effects, and overall impact of our private sector operations, which we document, we review, we assess, and evaluate and come through that. But I think as there's one overriding theme here, one of the key differences that we as ADB look at is about this issue about additionality. Uh, and I was very pleased to hear Mark here from the operations side speaking very clearly towards that. One of the great um, benefits of my job here in ADB is that we have real clarity about strategic objectives. It, it's up there for everyone to read. Strategy 2030, uh, everyone here in the room can, can look at that on the website and download it. Uh, as elucidated as well by Champion, is a very clear document. And we have a set of seven operational priorities within that document. And we've got to think again and ask really careful questions about private sector operations, about the additionality that they bring in that space. Where there are plenty of other actors in the private sector world who are looking to make investments within the regions and the countries that we work. But we've got to think very critically and hard about where ADB, as an operator in this space, can really add value and make a difference. Uh, and I, I think that's one aspect of evaluation which is particularly exciting. Uh, and within the institution as well, uh, a lot of our dialogue, the engagement we have with the private sector operations team is around, again, looking back at our strategic objectives and seeing to the extent that we match up to those strategic objectives. And, and it's a very interactive and healthy dialogue on those points. I think possibly later in, in, in our discussion here, we'll talk a little bit about some more of the concrete examples about how that works here in the institution. Uh, but that role and thought uh, about additionality is one of the key differences that we have. Um, the role of MDBs uh, in, in terms of private sector, I, I come from a uh, background possibly quite similar to Mark's on the operations side from IFC. Uh, there is the list of development challenges out there. The, the list of development challenges out there is, is substantial. And, and the public sector alone cannot do that. So we're always looking for ways to include private sector thoughts, um, innovation, knowledge, leadership skill sets, and, and financial capital to help solve those issues. So the private sector team uh, here, their role is, is going to grow. Uh, there are no end of challenges. And there are large pools of private sector capital that are looking for a good home. So uh, again, as Mark says, I think we're looking for ways to include that and, and find inclusive ways to help solve development challenges in that aspect. Thanks, Alex. So, so now we know private sector is very, very important for, for the growing uh, uh, needs of the region. Now let's dig in a little bit deeper, right, in terms of round two here. Uh, let's go through the panel again. Um, let's try and understand here what are the challenges of doing private sector evaluations, right? So we know the bank is primarily on, on the public side. So the object of the evaluation is very different. And so the way you're going to evaluate private sector is going to be very different from, from the public sector. So let's go through and ask the experts here in terms of what the challenges are in terms of doing private sector evaluations. Shanbin, with expanding private sector operations in the bank, what does that mean in terms of what's the challenges that you think the bank is going to face in terms of evaluating private sector? First of all, I think uh, with the scaling up uh, for private sector operations, it, the, the importance of effective and meaningful evaluation and influ influencing evaluation it, it can, can no longer, uh, can, cannot be underestimated. It's just become hugely important. 
I'm glad that uh, in, the, uh, in the, our independent evaluation office and a uh, department through uh, recent years and uh, going forward is in uh, uh, scaling up that evaluation and focusing on that uh, the skills and methodology and not just from the evaluation uh, IED department but, uh, the, uh, point of view but also bring up the skills and uh, awareness and skills of understanding of values of evaluation throughout the bank. Uh, so that is very, very uh, uh, important. If we say that, if that's a broad challenge, I think that would be broad challenge number one. And in fact, it's also a broad opportunity number one as here. And so the, the usefulness of the evaluation. So uh, instead of going into details, I would like to highlight the three eyes just to underscore how we should focus on this. The first is about information. We heard about data. We heard about uh, these things. It's that, and we heard about it in the in private sector uh, evaluation framework is different from the sovereign uh, of sovereign operations, and that this would just put extra effort on that uh, information set for and, uh, uh, underlying information for private sector uh, evaluations. I'm not just talking about quantitative data, it's also about qualitative and, uh, data. How do we conduct the interviews and uh, so on and so forth? And how do we get uh, that information when private sector business claim to be confidentiality? And uh, these are the, uh, th th these are, so one is about information. Second is really about the integrity. Here, the integrity of the methodology and the integrity of approach doing the evaluations, integrity of engagement with the evaluatees. So this is and you know, becomes a very very critical. And uh, so why this is so? This comes the third point, the third eye. This is influence. Unless evaluation results have that influencing effect, then the evaluation become really irrelevant or little value. To have that influence, the evaluators and evaluees will have to really end up working closely together. And uh, so, and this is applies to the public sector operations. This is also, and perhaps even more so, in the case of the non-sovereign operations. And uh, so here is, so information, integrity, and influence. It's all for the usefulness and the values of the evaluation for the purpose of, uh, uh, as we are scaling up. So I'll stop here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Shambhad. Now, Mark, uh, in terms of private sector operations, the bank is set up in a way where, across all operations of the bank, there is self-evaluation, and then there is independent evaluation. Can you talk us through how self-evaluation works in, in PSOD and how value addition and additionality are measured. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to be answering this question in 2019 and not 2018. Um, the, the reason being is that ADB was a, a member of a working group of MDBs who prepared the Harmonized Framework for Additionality in Private Sector Operations, and, and this was published in September of last year and uh, has now been adopted by PSOD. So we, we now, um, along with all MDBs investing in private sector operations, uh, are aligned, and the framework um, provides us with some very clear definitions of financial and non-financial additionality. And it also provides some consistency and accountability across all the institutions. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of the framework, but it can be found on the ADB website. I think most of the other MDBs have it on their sites too. So if anyone wants to look into the details there, um, that, that'll, um, you can find it there. Um, I'm also going to talk a little about, uh, a bit about uh, ex-ante assessment because PSOD is beginning to develop a new process to look at ex-ante assessment. Um, so this, this is going to be a very significant uh, component of our, our project development process. Uh, and what it will mean is that additionality will be a major consideration during project development. And a project won't get past concept approval stage if it fails to demonstrate a sufficient level of additionality. So when it, uh, Alexander comes to uh, review the project at the end of its, uh, its life, um, everything has been put into place so that we end up, we hope, with more successful projects. Um, 
Regarding other challenges for evaluation, I'd, I'd like to go down into some detail now because these are a couple of uh, issues that, that me and my team uh, have faced recently. Um, one, one is about lagging indicators. Um, we have a number of old projects uh, still, still on our books, particularly in the equity portfolio. Um, this is often where the fund we've invested in has, has failed. And the project then sits with our portfolio management team or with the credit risk unit for uh, quite a few years um, while the fund manager attempts to uh, offload the remaining assets. If the fund manager is still there, uh, sometimes it may be some form of receiver or, or somebody. So by the time we get round to preparing our, our project completion report, this may be uh, a project that's 10 to 12 years old. Uh, and so we get a, fa a failed project assessment included in our current year's statistics, which is not at all reflective of our current operations and investment strategies. And we also have a very uh, small number of PCRs prepared in each year. So with such a small sample size, a, a single unsuccessful project can really skew the data significantly. So we've yet to figure out how to deal with this. Um, there's more discussions to be had. Um, the second issue is, is rather than being um, a, um, delayed, it's what happens when things speed up. Um, and the second issue I want to talk about is early prepayment by some of our clients. Again, this is most often occurring in our equity portfolio. So the, the tenor or the length of PSOD loans is, is often much shorter than for Sovereign. Um, sometimes down to only three, or five year, three to five years in some cases. Uh, and the outcomes and outputs listed in the project's design and monitoring framework are usually set to the lifespan of the loan. Um, if the client then exercises the right to early prepayment, uh, it's often the case that they haven't met all the targets in their DMF due to a, a lack of time. And we're again left with a, a record of an unsuccessful or partially successful project. Um, and in those situations, uh, what's happening on the ground may be very, very different um, to the ratings because we might have seen significant progress in some areas towards these targets, but we've had insufficient time to actually achieve them. So those are two, uh, two personal bugbears of mine at the moment I'll leave you with. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, so Aman, uh, we, we talked about challenges um, on, on the data side. Now, can you walk us through some of the specific areas that would move the needle in terms of development effectiveness that maybe the bank could focus on on, on data? The timeliness of data is critical. So there's no use uh, having any financial data that is dated or is old. It does not allow for effective decision making at that regard. So if you received financial information particularly, uh, the, the more timeliness that data is received, the better. Now data on project impact or sustainability, that always by definition will come with a certain amount of time. But in terms of at least the financial component of the three components uh, that people have discussed, including Marvin, of uh, financial returns, economic, and uh, in terms of environment and safeguards, the financial data has to be very timely and the systems have to be able to respond to that very quickly. Um, the other challenge really is that data is expensive. Systems are expensive, so of course we have a very big project underway at the ADB, as I mentioned under Digital Agenda 2030, but that does require significant resources both in dollar terms and staff. The other challenge that I see really is a mindset challenge, as technology uh, helps us, but it also hinders us somewhat. It also, there's a resistance to using it. There's also a governance challenge with technology in terms of who controls it, who oversees it. What is the quality of that data? There's only, and this comes from my public sector experience, there are, you know, in the financial world, there's makers and checkers. So there's data that someone creates, but there has to be someone who verifies that data to ensure that it's accurate. Um, so I think from my perspective, those are really the issues with respect to data, not just here, but any organization. The robustness of the systems, the expensive nature of these systems, and then at the end of the day, the mindset of the users of the system, that data is meaningful. I think on occasion, people see it as a burden rather than as an asset. And there has to be a mindset change that it's really critical for organizations such as the ADB to have robust data to make uh, educated decisions on where to use their scarce resources. Yeah, well said, well said. I think now we've heard 
challenges at, at the corporate level, challenges in terms of evaluating private sector operations at the operational level, and we also heard about challenges in terms of data and systems. Now, Alex, uh, for independent evaluations, what are the challenges that you face? One of the areas that's previously been mentioned by Champion as well about the issue about confidentiality. If you're dealing with external private sector clients, uh, there's a degree that commercial results that come from their operations are want to be kept in-house. Now, we as an investor in those, in those private commercial operations have access to that data, but uh, they may be uh, understandably reluctant if we go and put that on the ADB website and say, uh, here are the operational flaws of company XYZ uh, for everyone to see. So we have a, a bit of a balance sometimes between uh, ADB has a very strong public disclosure policy and our need to have clear-headed uh, evaluations rich with data that actually make sense to different audiences both internally and externally. So that's one of the particularly unique challenges to work in private sector operations. We manage that uh, through, on occasions we have uh, reports which will have redacted text on, on key areas on, on private sector operations. But uh, what takes place in terms of an internal dialogue is very open, it's very fresh, the interaction between uh, our department operations. And one of the cultural aspects um, it, it is particularly interesting about the private sector side. Um, there's a lot of technical expertise within our private sector operations teams, as, as Mark has alluded to. The range of products and interventions from equity to loans to guarantees to risk sharing participations is extensive. We need on the evaluation side to match that and to speak the same language. So when we have those, uh, you know, set scene, uh, meetings at the board that we are talking a common, consistent language. Uh, when we're talking a, about a particular financial intervention, there's no, uh, it, 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 there's a clear and accurate use of language uh, that we're not sort of trying to uh, uh, look at things from different angles, that we understand each other very clearly. So that is a particular challenge uh, and we aim to meet that. We have experienced team, we have staff within evaluation who have private sector experience and that is, is a great asset in that regard. Um, the final point I, I, I think I'd, I'd like to highlight again is, is about um, making sure evaluation is understood within private sector operations but within the bank generally as a learning opportunity that if you end up uh, with a, a less than satisfactory rating on a particular project, uh, that that is also a learning opportunity. Uh, and I, I just say with a slight matter of pride that uh, the private sector operations in the last year won an award for the quality of their self-evaluations uh, on, on one particular aspect. And it wasn't for a successful project. It was for a project which had many challenges. Uh, but the way that that self-evaluation was written in a thoughtful, self-reflective, and, and pro-learning attitude uh, really impressed us within the independent evaluation team and we were delighted to recognize uh, the, the skill in which the team had handled that. So making sure there's a clear understanding that um, you know, good feedback and good evaluation is a gift, it's not a threat. Uh, and, and that sort of attitude is something that we really want to promote strongly within, within the bank as a well. whole. Yeah, I think uh, well said, well said. Now importantly, I want to now reach out to the audience for, for your questions. Now, so if you can please stand up, uh, introduce yourself, and uh, direct the question either to a specific panel member or to all the panel. Uh, we'll group some questions and then we'll go back to the panel. So first, uh, gentlemen over here and then... Group questions. Uh, yeah. Rajendra Gautam, Member of Parliament from Nepal. I want to understand a specific answer. How ADB is helping to evaluate development effectiveness to promote private sector. Effectiveness and to promote private sector. Thank you. 
Uh, I have uh, one question and one comment. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me just go first with a comment. Uh, you mentioned that the objectives of evaluation are different between the private sector and the public sector. I completely disagree. Completely disagree. To me, the objective of evaluation is identical between the private sector and the private sector. Only difference is that the, the goals are different. <laughs> So since goals are different, and therefore, certainly whatever you do for evaluation may have some difference, but in terms of objective, it's the same. Whether you want to be more efficient or relevant or you know, whatever the sustainability you talk about, economic, social, and uh, environmental, and so forth. So to me, uh, really, uh, both of them are completely identical. However, the goals are different. Okay, that's my comment. Now, my question is very serious <laughs> about ADV uh, operation at the moment. Um, you know, the, um, as, a, as a, one of the founders of ADV, <laughs> certainly, I mean, I come from Japan, and we do provide some funding to ADV. I think the, uh, my uh, question is this. When we set up ADV way back in 1967, we had underlying assumption and also understanding that although ADB is a bank, but it's a development bank. It's not just a commercial bank, okay? And therefore, development bank has two functions for ADB. I mean, other, there are many other functions, but also two very special functions when we set up ADB. What was to look at bankability in terms of longer term perspective. Longer term perspective, not short term, because commercial banks always look at the short term. And also heads of commercial banks are always talk, talking about, you know, what is the rate of return on the bankability and so forth. And uh, also it is reflected in their bonus and so forth. So it's completely different from the development bank. Huh? So the, um, to me, a uh, longer term perspective or the longer term forecast that any project may have for uh, ADB financing, of course, is very important. And to what extent uh, you look at in terms of long term? Now, what is the, what is the, long, the definition of long term? And that is my question, OK? And I'm sure it depends upon the project and so forth, and the different countries involved, too. But anyway, that's my question. But the second question to me is more important, and that is to say, to what extent is ADB really, you know, uh, in terms of private, I mean, I'm talking about private sector financing, to what extent ADB is really thinking in terms of the impact on a private sector financing by ADB in one country affects other countries also? That means regional perspective. And the reason why this is called the Asian Development Bank is Asia. That means you look at a complete Asian scene, huh? not just only one country, Philippines or Bangladesh, India, no. We're looking at the regional bank. Huh? So this is the reason why I'm asking you a question. To what extent do you still look into the regional perspective in funding or financing private sector? Thank you very much. Uh, let's take these two questions and then maybe one more question. Um, uh, well, let's take those three questions. I'm also from Nepal, from Nepal Evaluation Society. Uh, my voice is sometimes very low. Uh, anyway, you can hear. Uh, I'm also a board member of APIA. And many thanks for nicely mentioning challenges of private sector evaluation as 3i. It's very important and very problematic. And creativity, innovation, private sector growth is very much necessary in economic growth, growth of particularly developing countries like Nepal. In my country, private sector is growing, but not to the desired level because of different constraints, partly because of public sector problems. So what I would like to know from all of you is what ADB can provide, what can be the role of ADB to strengthen evaluators 
in doing private sector evaluation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let me summarize the questions. Maybe we distribute it among the, the panelists here. Now, let me, there's one qu comment that was raised. You know, I, w I was mentioning the object of the evaluation is different, not the objective. The objective is the same, but the object is different. What you evaluate is different. So if you're evaluating two different animals, it's OK. So I, hopefully that clarifies. That's why we have different guidelines for private sector versus public sector. Now, very important question. When ADB was set up as, as a development bank, uh, the ADB needed to behave differently than a regular commercial bank, and that it needed to be more long term. I look at that as value addition, as additionality, as how does ADB look at that? And I think Mark probably can answer that. And there was a question on the impact of private sector from a regional perspective. And that's very important because ADB is always striving to become an honest broker here, right? It's a preferred lender in the region. And maybe Sean Ben can talk more broadly in terms of what is ADB trying to do from a regional perspective, because it always has things that it's trying to do, not just in one country, one sector, but it's trying to replicate solutions across across regions that are widely applicable. Now, in terms of promoting private sector and promoting development effectiveness, maybe Alex can talk about that in terms of what are some of the things that ADB can focus on in terms of uh, development effectiveness, specifically on, on the private sector side, if there is one thing that they need to focus on and how can that be measured and tracked. And we can come back to Aman as well to, to comment on that particular question. So maybe Mark first. Yeah, interesting question uh, and one I think that's really at the core of ADB. Um, you, there were two phrases that I picked up on, on uh, from your comments. Uh, one was bankability and the second was, was long-term approach. Uh, and I think those two, two key issues are always at the heart of our decisions as to where PSOD investments are going to go. Bankability, okay, we have to have development impact. We want to show additionality, but we also need to have a sound financial and economic basis for a project. So yes, that is very much still key to our, our thinking. Long-term approach, um, I think um, maybe in a slightly different perspective from the 1960s, but now in, in the 21st century, the ability of ADB um, to um, extend the tenor of its loans um, uh, way beyond uh, what the commercial market is, is offering is a big benefit to us. Um, it enables us to partner uh, in certain big infrastructure projects that maybe we wouldn't have had a look in otherwise. Uh, so looking at the long-term uh, effect of ADB operations in PSOD, very important. Um, and also, we're looking to be able to uh, replicate uh, our projects. Uh, we want to look at being a, a, a gateway bank where we're facilitating new investments in regions where they haven't happened, uh, particularly recently in renewables, um, to show local markets uh, and commercial banks that they are viable, uh, and then replicate that and upscale that throughout the region. Um, I'll let Jean Bin talk more about the 180B approach and, and, and how the sovereign, non-sovereign um, programs can interact to, to achieve more regional cooperation. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Hirono Sensei. It's good to be and, uh, reminded by, uh, 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 of our uh, and the history, our, our um, origin, the, pur the purpose of uh, for the bank when it is uh, established, and we'll come back, uh, we'll come home and uh, hear us and say that uh, you are, you're visiting and uh, the bank. Uh, it's uh, uh, cross-country impacts of operations or sovereign op uh, non-sovereign operations. Uh, this is one thing where we uh, approach it in the following ways. Not exhaustive, just some example. We are pursuing cross-country operations. For example, this may not be long-term, but institutionally speaking, this is very long-term. Trade financing. 
trade financing program. We have the trade financing programs throughout the region. So they really address the, uh, the, the, the issues of, uh, of funding constraints and uh, credit. And uh, so that's one. And we have also the programs and the PSOD and, uh, and our uh, uh, both public and private programs working together to address, for example, some of the regional concerns, for example, agribusiness, value uh, uh, supply chains. These are the regional programs. And the third is that even for a large, uh, in a country looking at some large project, large uh, operations, we also need to assess how some of the uh, downstream, upstream, and uh, uh, impacts affecting sustainability issues, environment concerns, and social development concerns. Now, all these are, uh, are, are coming. Now, I would, uh, I would suggest, I would recommend that maybe in the mark and share with uh, uh, Hiro Sensei and others that the uh, private sector department produce, an, is that annually? Annually development effectiveness report. And which would address uh, the, 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 the honorable uh, parliamentary member from Nepal, how ADB is helping to promote a, uh, the, effect, uh, the effectiveness promoting the private sectors. That report would also uh, uh, present some uh, good, uh, good information. Hope that they have uh, addressed the, the questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Shanben. There was also one more question. Yes, please, please. Well, just one little point, and that is to say, you know, the uh, globalization started way, way back already back in 1971 when we had uh, moved from a so-called fixed exchange to a you know, floating exchange rate. Huh? Since then, there is a tremendous increase of globalization, economic, political, social, everything. Now, the, um, now we are facing this innovation like AI, huh? okay? coming up, technology, huh? from, from private sector. And we know that it will have some impact upon development you know, in any country. But if you look at AI, to what extent this AI is going to be adopted by small business as compared to the large scale industry? It looks like, at the moment, uh, large scale industries are much more, shall I say, advanced in terms of international AI. But small business also are now looking for, you know, the use of AI and other innovations, you know. So the, I want to know how ADB is looking at this new intrusion of innovation into private financing by ADB. Uh, we're running pretty short of time, so I'm going to very quickly answer that. Yes, we are very keen on that. Uh, PSOD has recently established a unit just to look at uh, how we can help with uh, companies, startup companies looking for new technologies, disruptive technologies. Uh, we're very keen to, to explore blockchain. Uh, one project I can give you an example of is a coffee grow uh, collective in one country that are growing organic coffee, finding it very difficult to uh, find a market. We believe that blockchain will give them access to buyers uh, securely uh, with payment uh, and, and quickly. So that's just a couple of very quick examples and yes, it's very much front and center in our thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, with the interest of time, I think we have to wrap up now, but there was also a question on evaluation capacity uh, in terms of uh, what can ADB do? Um, in fact, let me try and answer that. Uh, you know, I think Alex can also chime in there. So in, in the independent evaluation now, we have dedicated teams for communication and outreach and knowledge management. And so, so what we are focusing on even more now in the last couple of years is to take the knowledge not only to the rest of ADB, but also to take the knowledge to the countries. So we have programs here that we run every month in terms of evaluation capacity building. And we also have programs in the country. Uh, so if there is a specific interest in Nepal in terms of evaluation capacity, is something that we can talk separately. Um, so, uh, but but Alex, if you want to just quickly, just what, less than a minute in terms Absolute, of absolutely, just, just to chip in on that. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, uh, as you may have heard, a relatively uh, newcomer to the world of evaluation. But I was recently in a classroom in Shanghai, and we had three gentlemen from Nepal who were joining us there, who were there uh, going through a course which we work with the Shanghai uh, 
uh, Accounting University to promote evaluation best practice. Uh, it was a very interactive uh, discussion, so uh, within our own department, we're very actively uh, working with our local DNCs and, and colleagues and fellow evaluators in those, in those countries to promote good evaluation practice. Thank you, thank you. I'm not going to try and wrap up this, or you know, this, it was a very rich discussion, a lot of key messages, points that were raised, so I won't do justice if I were to give, synthesize all of this and give you a brief summary, but I want to thank the audience for uh, uh, listening and for asking wonderful questions, and a big round of applause for, for the panelists here, giving us wonderful perspectives. Thank you.